Um, just to thank Ellen and Yannis for, for the invite. I think it's the first time I'm giving a, a presentation in Limassol. <laughs> um, so be, before I start, I will uh, kind of refer to something that Martin said at the beginning of his talk, that um, you don't need everyone. Probably in the end you will need most people, but you can definitely not have everyone because not everyone will agree with you, no matter how ethical, how scientifically sound your argument is. Um, so you need to use different tools in order to get as many people on board. Or if they don't want to get on board, use tools to make them get on board, like legal tools and so on. So you need to be using many different ways. Um, for example, on the bycatch, uh, one of the examples that Martin talked about uh, with the bycatch project they're doing, which I, I think it's a very important project in Cyprus, it's something very new in Cyprus to discuss this issue. Um, when, uh, when the European Commission had to take action on bycatch was simply because a very famous chef, probably most of you will know him, Gordon Ramsay, um, kind of made a big campaign before there was a change in the big European uh, fisheries regulation, the common fisheries policy. So a couple of years beforehand, Gordon Ramsay, like through his shows, kind of brought up the issue of bycatch and he almost sing single-handedly with the, with the help of the NGOs bringing forward all the scientific work, but kind of all the public work and all the kind of getting all the society on board was done by kind of his campaign. Some scientists called it a bit of a populist campaign because it was kind of a black and white uh, argument. But to be fair to him, uh, so many years of discussing bycatch and so on, it was the only thing that made the European Commission do what they needed to do. Um, so, um, and yeah, something, else, something additional on the, on the discussion around kind of uh, getting as many people as, uh, as you can on board. I think the, the concept of the commons, and this is kind of what my presentation is arguing, so no, no science in my presentation, I know natural science, there's lots of social science uh, in my presentation, if you like. But um, the, the concept of the commons and how you bring that into your campaign or in your discussions or how you make people understand that you can also demand that this is protected because it's also yours. Um, it's quite important. Um, and I feel that in Cyprus, bringing in the concept of the commons in kind of various campaigns, managed to kind of, um, kind of create a, a, a break in kind of political and economic and, and narratives around that are kind of very much part of the current political and economic system that does not allow you to say that no, this development should not go ahead. Like you're labeled as being very radical when you're saying something that's, it should be common sense, like building like a big casino next to a, wet, uh, a wetland. That shouldn't be like a radical argument because you have the science as well, but um, that's, that's how it's been claimed. So, um, the, the question of, I think the, the element, the concept of the commons allows uh, for some kind of societal shift that helps in, uh, in, uh, in when, when you're trying to uh, make a change. So questions that will be kind of being brought in throughout my presentation is who decides what happens to the sea and the coastline? Um, how do we engage with institutional processes which are inherently unequal? There's lots of power dynamics uh, in many institutional processes. Uh, I'm sure Martin has, 
is like living through this all the time um, with bird life. How do we link these processes with our claims? Uh, and how do we bring in the question of the commons? And what's, what art has to do with it? I think that's quite relevant, uh, seeing all the posters as well. So it's something that I will touch upon quite uh, later on and just briefly. Um, but happy to have like a wider discussion on, on it later on. Um, just uh, for like short background information, maybe some people, I, I also see a lot of uh, new faces. So I'm part of a citizen's initiative. It's called Cyprus, um, Protection of Cyprus uh, Natural Coastline. Um, so we've been, we've been campaigning a lot on uh, issues that have to do with the protection of the coastline as well as the sea. So many of the things that I'm going to discuss kind of are linked to um, my work uh, with, with, the, with the initiative, but at the same time being um, like a scholar uh, in, in, working in academia with the con concept of the commons, um, I felt when uh, one of the campaigns, when our, our first campaign was, was starting, and I will discuss a bit about it later, um, I was reading a lot about the concept of, concept of the commons, and I was feeling that there was something very strong, there's a very strong argument to be made about the coastline uh, and its link to the concept of the commons. Um, so I'm going to give a bit, very brief uh, overview uh, as about the concept of the commons. Um, so it, it was made famous by um, Garrett Hardin in 1968. So what he wrote uh, a big essay about the tragedy of the commons. Uh, I'm going to read something uh, that some, um, a short expert, excerpt of his uh, essay. Uh, so he says, the tragedy of the commons develops uh, in this way. Picture a pasture open to all. It is expected that each herdsman will try to keep as many cattle as possible on the commons. Sh uh, such an arrangement may work reasonably satisfactorily for centuries because tribal wars, poaching and disease keep the numbers of both man and beast well below the carrying capacity of the land. Finally, however, comes the day of reckoning. That is the day when the long desired goal of social stability becomes a reality. At this point, the inherent logic of the commons remorselessly generates tragedy. As a rational being, each herdsman seeks to maximize his gain. Explicitly or implicitly, more or less consciously, he asks, what is the utility to me of adding one more animal to my herd? Uh, so he basically, uh, Hardin assumes that all human beings are rational beings who will never think about the collective and will only think of the individual uh, gain, which could be true, but what creates an individual and the, and the understanding of the individual against society is the economic, the political and the societal framework. Um, so that's something that uh, for Hardy, for Gary Harding was not uh, part of the discussion, but it's something that many um, uh, many academics, many researchers uh, explored uh, after after him. Uh, so Harding uh, talked about the famous "freedom in a commons brings ruin to all." Uh, so, yeah, as I said, since then, there's been a lot of critique to Hardin's theory. Uh, some have discussed about the fact that it's, it's um, the, open, the problem of an, being op something being open access, uh, and that's not the same as a commons, because a commons, the understanding of a commons is that society will create uh, the rules that will allow that commons to, to continue to exist. Uh, some have, have highlighted that the problem is not the fact that something is open access, um, but rather because individualized behavior leads to behaviors which can put something uh, in danger. Uh, and others have pointed out that it's neoliberalism as economic and political system which leads to such behaviors. 
so basically, Hardin's argument has been used uh, since then um, to privatize um, uh, or um, like natural resources uh, or common spaces or open spaces or uh, public spaces in order to manage them correctly. So it's been the tragedy of the commons uh, has been used a lot uh, in that respect. And I will try and give some, um, uh, some examples uh, later on. And I have to discuss this even uh, afterwards with some of you, uh, because this can be like a whole, uh, a whole presentation in itself. Um, so the commons refer as a definition, as a very short definition, refer to the cultural and natural resources which are held and or produced in common. Um, historically, uh, the commons was very, the, the concept of the commons was very widespread. You had common lands being used by landless communities. Um, and in that way, they had access to water, they had access to fuel. So you, you could have had like a forest which was a commons for a certain specific community uh, and um, by using that space to get fuel, to get warm or to forage uh, and so on, these communities could, uh, could survive. Uh, there was a big shift between the 16th and the 19th century where you had big uh, processes of land dispossession, so that was kind of the shift uh, between the feudal system to the Kind of the capitalist system where the, the concept of private ownership came uh, to, to become, become mainstream uh, and you had the violent enclosures of, of common areas uh, by landowners and the feudal power. Um, so that was when communities which needed the commons to survive uh, basically um, were left without um, without land to get their fuel from, to get their food from, and so on. And this a very famous uh, writer, Silvia Federici, who um, linked this process with kind of feminist narratives and the, the witch hunt. Uh, so witches were, um, were primarily a single women who were really, were really in need of these common lands to survive. Um, and because they were, and, and the kind of enclosures of this land made them even more vulnerable um, because they didn't have any other way to, to survive. Uh, usually um, the, concept, the, the commons uh, are without the legal status, so they fall somewhere between uh, private and the public. Uh, and especially in kind of the Western societies, uh, where we don't, we really don't have this uh, this concept. In Mexico, for example, um, you have in the the Chapas area or the Zabadistas, the ejidos. What they call the ejidos is really like uh, what used to be the common lands in the 16th century and beforehand. Uh, so you have some areas where this exists this kind of the, the concept of the commons, um, but the, the process of enclosures, which is kind of the, the process through which these spaces or these, these goods were um, taken away from uh, the communities who kind of manage them, uh, has really created like a binary between what's public and what's private. And that's kind of just to give like a, an overview. When it comes to the concept of space, because I will be talking about the marine area and the coastal space, I think that it's very important to bring in the, um, the concept of commoning, which is the kind of the process th during which commerce is created. Um, so we can argue that squares, the forests, the seashores, um, are, um, as commons can be understood through the concept of common space, of course. Uh, and that's linked, I don't know if there's any architects in the room except Yannis. <laughs> I know Yannis, of course, he would know. Um, so the, 
the concept of how you produce space also as a social element. Uh, and as it was brought forward by Henry Lefebvre, uh, it's linked to this idea of commoning. So ways of being and physical landscapes are interlinked, uh, creating a version of a space which is very important aspect of a person lived uh, experience within that space. Uh, so a very important Greek um, scholar who discussed the, um, the, the concept of the commons a lot describes common space as a set of spatial relations produced by commoning practices. And those can create forms of social life and forms of life in common. To some that may sound kind of a bit wishy-washy, but as I will uh, explain a bit later, I feel it's understanding the kind of these processes um, that can create psychological shifts in, um, in uh, parts of society that can like, help with a certain uh, campaign that's linked to a protection of something that should be considered a common space, a common resource, common heritage, and so on. Um, so the commoning is a practice which creates the commons. Um, Peter Linnebau, a very famous uh, historian from the UK who did a lot of work on kind of the process of enclosure that I described before, called it a cultural process. Um, Tim Rainier called it um, a subjective process which um, links to a collective psychological shift, um, which is something that's linked to uh, what I've said before. And Meretz also highlights that the commons are not just a good, but a social practice. Uh, and just a, a, a quote from Silvia Federici, I'll just highlight, I highlighted in red what, uh, I, for, because of a story I'm gonna just say afterwards. Throughout this process, she says, I have never forgotten what people who already live in the communita communitarian experience would say. You live the commons, you cannot talk about them, and even less theorize them. So kind of, Federici does it as well, I do it as well, but if you don't live the commons, it's very difficult to discuss about them. Um, which I think that's why when I, was, um, when I was reading about the concept of the commons and this campaign kind of came up, I realized what the commons are for me. That might not be the commons for everyone, um, so, the first campaign that uh, the, the initiative uh, did, it was a very small campaign and it failed miserably, and you will understand why. Uh, so it was this campaign by the minister of Paralimni to get rid of, uh, of the, the people who for, for years, for decades have been camping, have been moving kind of their village along the coastline um, and creating like temporary huts. And I, th I feel that this, this, the discussion about this being a commons is quite um, conflicting in many ways. So if you're not one of the persons who lived through this experience, you'll see, yeah, but they're kind of privatizing that space, right? Like, they, they are using it, I can't go because they're there. So it's, I understand kind of the difficulty in um, understanding why this is a commoning practice. Uh, and slowly, this practice has led to a deterioration of the coastline. So we, we have had a sort of tragedy of the commons in this case. Um, but the way, so that's a, big discussion that can again be uh, a separate talk, but the way that the mayor of Paralim decided to fix this was this. <laughs> so he decided to destroy the coastline. Um, in reality, he wanted to destroy the coastline because he wanted to add more sunbeds and umbrellas. And of course, um, 
to create more real estate opportunities on the area above. Um, some uh, who like gossiping say that uh, it's because he owned some of the land up there, but this is just something we've heard. Um, so in this case, you have someone who's been uh, claiming that you have a situation where you have a mismanagement of public land, uh, trying to fix it by uh, entering with a bulldozer and completely destroying it. Uh, but in reality, if, if you learn more about what was ha has been happening for decades in, on, the, on, the, on the coastline and the importance it had for the community, like the temporary huts they've been setting, what they've been doing, and how a few years ago they were uh, taking care of the coastline, you can understand how that can be understood as a process of commoning. Uh, so I'm happy to discuss that. Uh, at some point. Um, so when it comes to uh, the sea, uh, what I'm arguing is that um, the sea and the coastline offer like a very promising field for discussing about the commons and the importance of the commons for society and kind of making society understand that there are commons for which we should all um, have a say about and try uh, to make uh, arguments for, for their protection. Uh, so when it comes to the ocean, the, the standard kind of definition of the ocean that we get in geography at school is that it covers more than 70% uh, of our planet, but they're arguably still the least privatized asset of humanity. So in 2022, that's quite, it's quite an important thing because most, um, most of the land, like a big part of the land and a big uh, of our understanding about land is that it can be privatized and that's kind of the mainstream um, argument. When it comes to the coastline, um, despite the fact that the commodification of the coastline, it, it goes further back, especially on, uh, like in, in Cyprus. Um, I think the majority of the society does understand and does appreciate the coastline as one of the probably greatest manifestations of, of the commons. Um, and uh, just to give an example, I think there will be considerable reactions if a person walking, a, walking along the seashore would meet like a fence that would stop it, stop her or him to like go and walk uh, along the coastline and close to the sea, rather than if a person was walking through a field and found a fence. So the second part would seem very normal. Okay, someone's land, I cannot go. But if you would come across it across the coastline, that would be that wouldn't be accepted by m many of us. Um, and not just kind of the, ra the more radical part of society. Uh, slowly, policies are changing uh, kind of this, this understanding of society. Um, so you have the European uh, strategy, the blue growth strategy, for example, which kind of promotes new economic opportunities and interest on the sea. Uh, so we have technological advances which are allowing us to use the sea for more things. Um, and um, a lot of political uh, shifts as well. So these are creating kind of narratives and policies that suggest that, yeah, the sea can be privatized in some sense or can be used in the coastline as well uh, and so on. So I've put a few pictures that show like different forms of privatization in, at sea. Uh, we have marine aquaculture that's in uh, Limassol. You can see like the port at the back. Um, off wind energy, uh, offshore wind energy production at the top. You have um, large scale uh, fishing at the bottom. 
With fishing, it's kind of even more interesting because uh, policies in over the last kind of 20 years not only have led to privatization of the sea itself, uh, so you have big um, companies, fishing companies, who are able to buy quotas from others. So in a way, you're privatizing the individual fishes as well. Um, but when it comes to kind of the changing, the shifting imaginary of the society when it comes to what the sea can be used and the fact that, yeah, the sea can be cut up in pieces. Uh, I think it's um, mostly we can't really understand it from like the, my first image, which I think for most of us, that's quite a normal image now. So it's the Cypriot, exclusive economic zone, cut up in plots. You can see the different uh, oil and gas companies who have leased the different plots. That's kind of the beginning of how our imaginary is changing for what can be privatized and what's not. Um, so when it comes to the issue of hydrocarbons, kind of these images helped uh, that the society, the Cypriot society, would not um, really react in, uh, in, in any attempts to kind of uh, lease or um, exploit those, uh, those plots, even though, even in terms of climate science, it did not make sense. Even 10 years ago, it makes less sense today. Um, for Limassolians, I think the commodification of the, the coastline and the sea view is kind of um, it is part of your everyday life, uh, unfortunately. Like, you experience it every day. Um, and again, images that have been kind of thrown at us for many years, um, kind of trying to uh, beautify this, this shift of the coastline. So making people who can afford it want to buy this and making people who cannot afford it be jealous that they cannot buy it. So the, you've, you've had this kind of um, images being portrayed um, everywhere. Um, and sorry about my notes, I know they're very annoying. And of course, the, the reason, so who and why, uh, so who decides to um, uh, what happens to our common heritage and so on. Unfortunately, if we allow it, we all know who decides. So um, this is just so that you don't feel so bad. I'm from Ayanapa, so this is a photo from uh, kind of the destruction of the coastline I'm part of. Um, and this is um, one of my favorite banners. It was made for the first, uh, the, well, the, the first kind of bigger protest that the initiative called for. Uh, the first one was a tiny one outside the Paralimni municipality. I have a photo of that later. Um, but for me, this is like, it's a manifestation of kind of what I'm trying to, to say. Uh, that there's a big part of society, I think, which given the right words, can actually come out in the street or kind of share the view that there's some things that are not for sale. Uh, so that's the beaches, the seas, the forests. You know, the, the atmosphere is a commons, but that's kind of a bit more complicated. So if we want to discuss like climate change and global commons and so on, but I will not go uh, into that uh, now. So appropriation of the commons um, can happen in many ways. Uh, and using different tools. So we, we saw the example in Paralimni, where you had one person with authority uh, deciding to exert this authority, even if, it, if they were doing something illegal, where like eight years after some of the first pictures, 
he's still the mayor of Paralimni. Um, so nothing has happened to him. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's why I said the first campaign fa failed miserably uh, because it didn't manage to do what it wanted to do. Um, there's legislative changes, which is one of the examples I'm going to show right after. And then there's also licensing of uh, projects or plans, which can, which can have um, a negative impact on some of our um, uh, part of our common heritage. So Agamas is one example, uh, Akrodiri is another example, um, kind of uh, individual projects as well, like the City of Dreams in Limassol is another example. Uh, so societal uh, resistance is also critical, so it's a one very important tool uh, if we want to, um, to stop uh, some, uh, some of this destruction that's happening. Um, and from, from my experience, what I've seen is that the sea and the coastline do uh, still trigger, can still act as a trigger to, to part of society. Um, that, uh, and as I'm sure as most of us uh, here understand and appreciate that in Cyprus especially, it's very difficult to get society engaged in these issues. So I think Agamas is, is one example, the sea, the coastline are some of these examples that kind of for some reason, how trigger societal kind of um, resistance. There's some um, issues there. Um, so, what I want to just briefly touch upon for in the rest of my slides is like the importance of being present, um, and that can be uh, in in various in numerous ways. So it can be uh, by being around the table, um, by creating very good science that can be put on the table in order to, um, to lobby uh, and make someone uh, and make kind of those in power um, take you seriously. You have legal tools, you can go to court. It's a very long process, it's a very expensive process, uh, but sometimes it might end up being your last resort and I feel that in the current political state that we're in it might be the only thing that's that can stop things at some point because you can get hundreds of people on the streets and so on and show the best science that exists and might it might not make a difference so you you have to also use the the legal route um, so here I just have some examples of being present. We have some examples, some pictures. Uh, so up there is from the Paralimni Town Hall, where after kind of the first interventions with the bulldozers, part of the initiative, we went outside uh, the municipality and we turned it into a beach. Uh, so like our argument was, okay, you want to create beaches everywhere you're going to break up the coastline to create a beach, we're going to turn the municipality into a beach. So we went there with kind of um, umbrellas and so on. Um, the bottom picture is from an intervention outside the Department of the Environment, and it was after, I don't remember which uh, round of licensing of, uh, of villas at the sea caves in Bega, uh, so it must have been like the third or the fourth kind of round of... Um, so we were thinking, we, we went and we kind of uh, created like a, an installation that said, okay, just shut it down, you cannot do your job properly, you're obviously not reading the science that's out there and you keep licensing more and more uh, above like uh, one of the most important sea caves uh, on the island. Um, the picture above is like the first uh, big, big protest, and I say big protest because maybe for the time it was big, it was approximately 300 people outside the parliament, uh, but today we would consider it being relatively small, 
Um, and the reason I want to highlight that, um, that campaign is because it was a campaign about um, an attempt of the government to change the definition of real estate uh, and it was simply trying to add like a sentence and include marine space into the definition of real estate. So it was a very tiny um, change, alteration in the law. Um, like none of the parliamentarians actually read like this amendment that was coming in. So we saw it and was like, what's happening here? Um, and we actually created a big fuss and they had to uh, back, um, they had to revert. So it was actually quite a, a successful campaign, but it was, it was a hit and miss. So if we didn't happen to follow uh, the discussions that were taking place at the parliament at that time, we would not have realized, and the parliamentarians would definitely not have realized. So this was, would have passed without anyone understanding, which would, so what, what having um, the sea entering the definition of real estate it means that it opens up many opportunities for privatization of the sea and the coastline. Um, so how a small sentence, like a very small amendment in the law, can have very serious implications for um, marine ecological systems, coastal systems, but also society. And I just added that photo because it was, I was very angry. I was, uh, it was like my first experience in like, police, like a politician ignoring me because I was a woman. <laughs> So we went with Glidos to give like um, a very big petition. It was uh, over 4,000 people. Uh, it was the same campaign that I just talked about. And he just refused to look at me. So I was talking and he would just look at Glidos. I would explain to him who completely ignored me. And you can see there at my face, I was like, okay, <laughs> this is not okay. Um, my final example which I'm sure many of you will find very boring, uh, but it's, it's to highlight the importance of being present sometimes for the, from the start um, and sometimes for things that might seem not very important. Of course, uh, me as part of the initiative and GLIDOS really got into um, the consultations, BirdLife was involved as well, uh, but the initiative kind of really focused on this. This was what we were doing for quite a few months. Uh, so the marine spatial plan, just to link it with what I taught, um, how I spoke about uh, Garrett Hardin and the tragedy of the commons at the beginning, it's an attempt by a governance institution to sort out the different activities that are taking place at sea. So we have a, the sea where it has no planning zones. Um, so you, you are meant to be having people doing whatever they want, which is, is not the case, but you're having more people want to enter the marine field as a business, as an economic space. So you need to create a plan that to allow this new, uh, this new economic activities to take place without kind of um, conflicting and fighting with one another. Um, so this uh, was um, one of the Cyprus's, um, what's the word, um, requirements, so we had to do it according to the EU and in the current economic political system, the MSP, is, is, it can be a good thing if you get in from the beginning um, with uh, a mindset that, okay, we need to kind of make this as business oriented as possible. So that's what we try to do. Um, so what we managed to do in the end was that in the final uh, law of the Marine Spatial Plan, there's, um, there's uh, uh, an article that talks about w whatever new activity comes, ha um, is, uh, tries to enter the marine space of 
the Cypriot EZ, must, um, must prove that he's doing it for the public interest. So this, I, I know that it can be defined in many ways, what is public interest, it can be economic, it can be socioeconomic and so on, but there's quite a strict definition of what public interest in, is in law. So the fact that we managed to secure that article within the law allows us to, to have a bit more of a say as to what new activities will enter the, the marine realm. So being part of uh, a very legalistic um, process is probably quite important in what will happen to the marine space in the future. And I say it might because you, you never know what happens. I mean, if, if uh, something is licensed to be done at the marine space that we don't consider or in legal terms that is for the public interest, we would need to take it to court. So it would depend if we have the possibility to take that, um, that decision to court uh, in the end. So, and finally, uh, what art has to do with it? Um, so, I, I found a very, uh, a quote that I really liked from uh, Betsulo uh, that talks about critical interruptions. Um, so, for Betsulo, critical interruptions uh, are acts of rhetorical invention um, as practical communication strategies to taken for granted narratives and practices. So a taken for granted narrative and practice could be, for example, the fact that um, we should give some development opportunities within the Agamas protected area because it's good for communities. No, you need to find ways to show that actually that's not the case, but you can also show that in uh, in some kind of more artistic way. So the picture above, it's from one of the first protests that were um, took place for Agamas, and it was close, I think it was 23rd of December, and we took a um, Vasilovica, so it's a very tra the traditional uh, Cypriot cake that we do for New Year's, and we, we, pre we pretended that the Vasilovita is Agamas, we gave a, bit, a small bit to uh, the environment, a very small bit to the economy, uh, and a big part to kind of um, businessmen, and another big part to the, to the church. So to kind of discuss, okay, we're talking about ownership of land within the protected area, who's actually owning that land, and what can we do um, to support the, the, smaller, the small landowners who might own the land. Uh, how can we change that? Or we played them here, and the, 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 you cannot see it very well, but we played Gazandi. Um, so it was, you have the different development plans, um, the, the different projects that various famous uh, um, authorities or the various famous uh, in, um, businessmen um, had in mind, and they were public. So we have the Limni Golf Resort uh, by Mr. Chagolas. We had uh, Fontana Morosa, the plan for Fontana Morosa by Mr. Fodiadis, uh, the plan for Doxeftra by the Archbishop, and, and so on. Um, so those are kind of some artistic interventions that uh, the less professional artists did, uh, like from, from, the, uh, from the initiative. Uh, though we, we have some artists in the initiative that wrote uh, songs that, um, about Agamas and about Limni that really kind of helped um, draw attention. Uh, and this, maybe some of you know, uh, this, is, this was a performance uh, by Susanna Fialas, was called Space Invaders. It was at the Limassol Dance Festival, Summer Dance Festival, in 2019. 
um, I was one of the uh, dinosaurs and I was very happy that I was with no, not the performer. Um, so the idea of Space Invaders was that um, it was using this idea of um, the building of the high rises was becoming the norm in Limassol. So it started as an exception. So it was a derogation from the local plan of Limassol to build these high rises, but then it became the exception. So suddenly there were high rises across like the coastline of Limassol. Uh, and uh, Susanna um, thought about having uh, these comical figures who are kind of taking up a lot of space uh, and the, the, the performance was taking place across the beachfront uh, at Molos. Uh, so, you know, you had people lying and uh, like enjoying the sun and you had like these massive dinosaurs walking and like annoying uh, people who were enjoying it, like a common space. <laughs> Um, so, I think in Limassol you've had a lot of artists who uh, have, uh, have, been, have been doing really excellent work, um, uh, linking it to, to, uh, to many of the things that have been taking place. Um, and I'm going to finish with, uh, with this poster. It's actually another Limassolian that, uh, that did it for the initiative, it was the campaign for the, when it was, there was the attempt to add the marine space in the definition of real estate. Um, at the time, I asked Despina Ganauru to, I just sent her a message because she came to some of the open assemblies that we did to explain what was happening, and I said, do you have any idea of a poster th that we could use for the campaign? Uh, and Despina was like, I don't have that much time, but I'll make something. And, she sent it to me and she was like, I'm really sorry, I don't have much time. But for me, it's like, I think that was in 2015. It's still one of my favorite posters. It's it just it's so simple, but it sums up like that some things are not for sale. So even though the, the idea of the commons nowadays has changed, so it's not so much about um, you know, common, the common lands that existed before that we needed for fuel and, and this and the other. But it's something more than that, that yeah, maybe as society we do need and we do need to uh, fight for. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you.